our recording has begun and why don't we uh, why don't we officially begin good morning everyone uh, good afternoon good evening good, and good night as they say in the Truman show uh, we have uh, people from all over the globe on this call with us thank you so much for taking the time uh, and I am honored to have with us today the father of online dispute resolution Ethan catch um, I think he's a little annoyed every time we use that uh, uh, name for him, but there's no question that it is true, his humility notwithstanding. Um, Ethan is the person that names the field of online dispute resolution with his first book, Online Dispute Resolution. It came out with Janet Rifkin in 2001. Uh, Ethan started the Center for Information Technology and Dispute Resolution at UMass Amherst, which eventually evolved into the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution at ODR.info. Uh, Ethan kicked off the first pilot uh, with eBay uh, to do online dispute resolution back in the day uh, that eventually evolved into Square Trade and then evolved into the eBay ODR program and resolution center that I was lucky enough to manage for a couple of years there. Um, Ethan also started the uh, conference, the national, the uh, international conference on online dispute resolution uh, that we've now run every year since 2001 and has met all over the world. And he also started ADR Cyber Week, which is the online conference that happens. Uh, every year, the free online conference talking about ODR. So really, pretty much everything that we've got going on in the ODR field, I think you can trace it back to uh, to Ethan's initiative in the early days. So I think I've bragged on you enough, Ethan. I could go on, but... Um, uh, well, to set the, set the stories a little straighter than... Okay, than please, that. please. That's I'm, by, my side, by my side, alongside me, for all of those things, was you, Colin. So. Well, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> If if I remember Except, the early days, yeah, um, Ethan, when Ethan had the pilot going with uh, with eBay, um, I went out and met with Ethan because I was working at Mediate.com. This is back in '99, and I said, Ethan, we should work together. We should build this uh, eBay ODR pilot together. Um, but in fact, Ethan had been contacted by a team of uh, young, bright people from Harvard Business School that had started a company called Transecure. And uh, Ethan made the decision to work with them as I would have made the same decision. I mean, these were Baker scholars from HPS and they were very well capitalized and Transsecure eventually turned into Square Trade. So uh, there was a time with which, in which Ethan was associated with the Square Trade team and I was associated with the online resolution team and we were a little bit competitors. So uh, I give you credit because during that period, Ethan, obviously you were building all of the foundations of the field. So. It hasn't always been by your side. There's been times when we've worked at cross purposes, but we worked that out fairly early on. Well, I must say, Colin, it's easy to get along with you. So whether uh, you're right by my side, competing with me, whatever. Okay, good. We're a mutual <laughs> admiration society. Well, we oh, that's right. Well, uh, I, I, we'll, 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 we'll move from that foundation. Okay, okay, so what I'd like to do, my aspiration for the session today is sort of go back to the beginning of all of this and walk through how ODR has developed and some of the key insights you've had along the way and then bring it up to where we are now and then maybe do some uh, prognostication about where we may be going. Um, I think Ethan and I wrote an article a few years ago uh, that was that I think it was titled, What We Know and What We Need to Know. And the beauty of that framing is you can always uh, answer that question. I think maybe we should update that paper. But uh, but let me, let me start out, way back at the beginning, Ethan, before we knew each other, when was the first time the concept of online dispute resolution came into your mind? This notion that we're going to need to use technology to resolve disputes, or there are going to be new kinds of disputes. Can you, can you uh, think back to the genus of all of that? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I, I, I started teaching at the University of Massachusetts in, in 1970. And uh, my interest was in, uh, was largely in media and the law and what impact the media would have on the law. And my initial interest was in television and um, I published a variety of pieces on, on law and television, the influence of television on, on how citizens think about the law. But at some point in the 1980s, it occurred to me that the technology to write about was not television, but computers. And uh, I wrote a book in 1989 called The Electronic Media and the Transformation of Law. And there is a chapter in there about conflict. 
it's not about conflict resolution, but it's about half of the story, which even today, half of the story is the fact that conflict is generated by new technologies. And that idea was, um, seemed obvious. Didn't, certainly didn't seem like a, a new endeavor or a new field was being developed, but uh, why was it obvious? Because uh, computers really do two things. They, they communicate information and they process information. And the more of that that goes on, inevitably, uh, you end up with conflicts. So I think uh, a theme going back a long time is that new technologies generate conflict. And um, how, what do you do with those conflicts? So in the early to mid 90s, um, not only me, but a variety of other people had the idea that uh, there needed to be systems to resolve these conflicts. I was fortunate to have a, a colleague on, on the UMass faculty, Janet Rifkin, who was one of the founders of the field of alternative dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had sitting in the next office, literally, uh, one of the foremost authorities on ADR. And uh, as Colin mentioned earlier, we collaborated on a book in the late to, late 1990s, um, proposing that there was this field of online dispute resolution uh, that was needed because ADR wasn't enough. Uh, ADR, and, and the reason, uh, maybe digress for a second, um, the frustrating part over time was that the ADR field didn't really latch on to the ODR concept. Uh, I, I attribute that to this strong belief or faith in the value of face-to-face -face meetings. And of course, ODR uh, relied on things occurring at a distance. So um, there has been a, I'd say there's been a, a field, certainly a small field, but a field in which Colin was always there. Uh, from the mid 1990s on, mm -hmm. in 19, there were fortunately a few foundations uh, that saw the value of this, and one of them sponsored a, a meeting of mostly law professors in 1996, and um, those papers are still online. Uh, and that was the, the NCAIR meeting, right? The yeah, NCAIR, our National Center for Automated Information Research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they had been responsible for promoting the use of uh, computers in law schools. Mm. And, um, and they were kind enough to sponsor this meeting. Uh, and then the other, for, for me at least, and for my colleagues, the, the notable event of the of the 1990s was that the Hewlett Foundation gave us some money uh, mm -hmm. to get the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so we were the only uh, only technology oriented endeavor at the time that Hewlett, which of course is a tech, was maybe still is a technology company, uh, gave money for. Um, but that that sustained us and, and uh, whatever we did for the next uh, seven or eight years was um, fortunately supported by, by Hewlett. Yeah, and I wanna go back to that NCR conference because I think that was the first gathering that I know of that officially talked about uh, online dispute resolution, yeah. you know, sort of what the field could be. Now, I know uh, Hank Parrott, he had the virtual magistrate project at Villanova. I think that's where he was at the time. And I think there was a, a, a divorce mediation pilot that was happening right. in Maryland that uh, Richard Granite, I think, was involved in. So can you talk about those early days, you know, sort of what, what came out of that meeting and sort of what the community felt like back then? Well, that meeting, what came out of that meeting was uh, financial support for three, three ODR projects. And, and I'm not sure the, you know, the term ODR was even used before that meeting, but um, it was a gathering in D.C., 30 or so people. If you uh, 
Google NCAIR, you might uh, find all of the papers that were prepared for that meeting, but, but they, uh, there was agreement on, on a number of things. One is uh, that there would be some funding for these three projects, one called the Virtual Magistrate, one which we ran the online ombuds office, and mm -hmm. one run by uh, the University of Maryland Law School on Family Disputes. Uh, everybody thought that family law was appropriate, family problems were appropriate for this, uh, because families even then were spread out took uh, quite a while before that idea became routine. Uh, but um, the, uh, the impetus for the NCARE meeting was partly a, a lawyer in DC who uh, thought he had an agreement with America Online, AOL. Mm -hmm. AOL in the late 90s was the main I don't know, main... Uh, they were the mover and shaker. They were sending out all those little yeah. CDs. Yeah, everybody was, <laughs> yeah, AOL. Yeah. Any of you over 50 probably received CDs in the mail from them. You know, CDs from Netflix, CDs from AOL. Um, if you wanted to be online uh, and have access to the internet, AOL in the late 90s was a means for, for getting that. Uh, and. AOL generated huge numbers of disputes. Uh, I remember sitting in my office and I'd get calls from high school students. They'd just gotten thrown off of AOL. Mm. And it's, it would be like getting thrown off of Facebook or I don't know what today. Uh, so they, they said, you've got to do something about this. So we, um, this lawyer in DC, David Johnson, thought he had an agreement with the general counsel of AOL. Uh, to to funnel disputes to somebody, and uh, but they we had this meeting and then AOL reneged. <laughs> so at the time, uh, there was the, the the meeting ended up with one one dispute, and uh, it was really a made up dispute just because we needed to have a dispute. Sure. So, sure. Um, so that was um, that was an influential meeting. Influential in the sense that a um, bunch of people who, uh, over time, became fairly well known in the law and technology field, sure, uh, got together and and discussed this and pushed for it. And um, the the. The noteworthy thing about America Online and, and this meeting was, at the time, one dispute was was a lot. Nobody yeah. could put their finger on any prior disputes. Well, we 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 think about eBay and sixty million disputes, or Alibaba and claiming a hundred million disputes. Right. Uh, and the the pilot project Colin referred to earlier, we we handled two hundred disputes. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about that. I think that's a good thing. And, and Jim is calling out. There were parallel things happening at the same time. You know, uh, IGC had ConflictNet. I know there was work around like uh, forum moderation disputes and things like that. So, you know, there were there were multiple threads evolving. But the whole notion of the ODR field was really enshrined in what CITDR and Ethan and Online Ombuds Office were, were doing. But this pilot that emerged with eBay was really a, a crucial kind of big bang moment. So why don't, why don't you talk about that, how that yeah. came? came uh, I should note, this is my, my recollection of things. Sure. Um, others, some of you on this uh, call may have a different recollection and, and your recollection may be right, but this is, is what I remember. Uh, the uh, the pilot project was uh, was interesting in a number of ways. Uh, one way in which it got started, um, eBay had eBay. Uh, Colin knows more about this probably than anyone, but eBay didn't start out having uh, market share that it ended up with. Mm -hmm. uh, there were other auction sites at the same time. And uh, one of them, I don't remember it's the name of it. I think it was like uh, one of the, Web I'm or sorry? Auction. yeah, I, I, I auction Web or something. Yeah, I, yeah. it's been lost uh, in the of, one of yeah. one of them. 
uh, have been purchased by eBay for something like 40 or $50 million. The auction site was being run by four University of Cincinnati law students, and, uh, and they, they developed this uh, auction site and then sold it for uh, what at the time was a huge amount of money. Um, but eBay inherited not only the, the, the site, but inherited these four people and, and didn't know what to do with them. And they so knew the about General you. Counsel, your this is, again, you know, this is what I was lost told. They were law students. Okay. Yeah. What was eBay going to do with four law students? So the general counsel of eBay uh, thought to himself, well, why don't we try to resolve some disputes online? So he came to this, I think, on his own. And, uh, and one of those four law students called me up one day and said, would you, you think you could handle a small pilot project? And, and we did. We didn't handle it all that creatively, but we hired a mediator and uh, was a skilled real world ADR kind of mediator. Uh, and he worked full time for two weeks resolving all of these disputes about uh, purchases, still the same kinds of categories of things. Yeah. Things were broken, things didn't arrive, whatever. Well, I think uh, right. eBay put a link on their homepage, right? That said, if you have a dispute, click yes, here. Yeah, and it just created this massive wave of cases that Mark Eckstein had to figure out how to deal with. Yeah, but 200 cases at that time, well, the, the previous like, large, no, largest number was one. So we went from one to 200. That seemed uh, extraordinary. Um, then Colin mentioned square trade. Square Trade hand, managed to handle a million or more. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then Colin filled up the auction site with many, 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 many millions. Well, and now we've got Alibaba and Facebook that are probably generating a, a yeah. step function higher. Um, but yeah, definitely the roots were in that e-commerce. I mean, obviously there'd be no ODR eBay pilot if not for that, uh, that initially. And uh, Jim asked, is it accurate that all of these back in the day were text only mediations, what Mark was doing? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, they were, they were not handled very creatively. Uh, what we did was, I mean, there was no precedent for any of this. So we, we hired a mediator who, who we, we knew. And uh, Colin's right, there was a note on eBay's website. If you have a dispute, you know, here's the link. It was all textual, um, not very, no, no built-in intelligence. Uh, but there were lots of disputes. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, let me ask also about the UDRP and the domain name dispute resolution protocol. Um, I know you were involved with some of the earliest stages of the design of the UDRP, and also you were involved with e-resolution um, in, in the early days. So can you give us a little of the history about that? Yeah, so uh, domain names surfaced in the um, probably mid-90s as something valuable. Domain names were, you know, domain names like uh, ebay.com or whatever.com or whatever.net. Uh, you, um, domain names started were started and uh, in the around 1984 and 1985 and uh, managed until the mid 90s by a single individual. By 1990, there were about 8,000 domain names. Um, by 2000, there were over a million domain names. Um, the 90s were an interesting time for domain name, for anyone interested in domain names because uh, very few people understood that there would be value in, in a domain name. Uh, so some journalists, you can look this up, some journalists registered mcdonalds.com, called the company and said, you know, I, I registered this domain name, mcdonalds.com, and McDonald's said, who cares? Uh, and uh, it took them a while to understand that these things had value because uh, there were no search engines until Google in about 1998. Uh, so to identify a company on the web, 
uh, required that you understand, you know, their domain name. So, um, so domain names became known, domain names became valuable. And uh, like I said before, um, when things become valuable and become popular and involve lots of, um, lots of interactions, uh, they generate disputes. So by the late 1990s, lots of disputes over domain names were, were, being, uh, were occurring. These were disputes involving trademarks. So uh, um, people would register domain names that were the same as uh, a name that was trademarked. Uh, so McDonald's.com, McDonald's ultimately, or similar companies uh, said to themselves, we can't allow this. So uh, they took, they influenced a new organization called um, ICANN, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, mm -hmm. rather dreary name that's hard to understand where it came from, but uh, that was what it was called. And it was given uh, jurisdiction over domain names by the U.S. government. Uh, and in 1998, established uh, an ODR procedure, uh, sort of like a uh, arbit online arbitration. If you owned a trademark and somebody registered the, the name that was that trademark, um, you could go to this and you could file a claim and, and, uh, and have the claim uh, arbitrated. And if uh, it turned out that you had registered this claim illegitimately, or you had registered the domain name illegitimately, you could, uh, you could have it returned to you. Uh, sure. Because all these domain names, uh, enforcement is always a problem, but in this case, it was intriguing because the way to enforce uh, or return a domain name is simply to do something with the overall huge database that uh, existed in which all of these domain names were present and you know, in some field, instead of uh, where it said owner, he was just changed who the owner was. So, mm -hmm. um, but this became, yeah, a, these, these domain names are still being fought over. If I asked you how many domain names there currently are, anybody want to hazard a guess? If you, if the system will let, let you have, well, it's sure. about 350 million wow, domain that's... names. And, and they're still being, still being uh, issued and bought and purchased. Uh, originally, uh, there were only three or four, dot .com, dot .net, and um, dot .org, dot .edu. And dot .edu, so four. Uh, you couldn't register dot .edu unless you really were, had proof that you were an educational institution. But the other three were open to anybody. So what, what's, this, what's the problem? Well, everybody wanted just a .com name. And what happens when you create scarcity? Uh, values of things go up and uh, conflicts over things also go up. So if there had been lots of different domain names, not simply .com, .net, .org, but whatever, uh, as there actually are today, uh, today you can register anything anything you want, costs a fair amount of money, but you can register uh, dot, dot column rule if you want. Uh, I already got that one. Yeah. Oh, uh, dot column rule, not column rule dot That's com. right, not column yeah. rule dot com, but That's dot right. column rule. The extensions, yeah. right. Yeah. You better make a note and get go get that, that before yeah. one of these people registers it. I'm sure the demand will be hot. Uh, yeah. uh, in any event, uh, it, it's a, it was an interesting uh, set of uh, events of how disputes were generated, attempts were made to resolve them. Um, some people made lots of money over them. Other people invested a lot of money and made nothing. Right. But um, ICANN still manages the domain name business and business has changed radically from what it was what, a little more than 20 years ago. And you built something called the UDRP DB with the support from the Markle Foundation. What was that about? Right, so you're taxing my memory a little bit, Colin, but <laughs> uh, 
their um, the, these domain names, the domain name disputes uh, were were settled, and but nobody knew how to. There was no concept of precedent, mm -hmm. so each case was simply on its own, and. Uh, after a time, there were hundreds of these cases and nobody could find anything in the case. So there was a real need for uh, some form of access uh, to, to these disputes to see how arbitrators had, had ruled in these cases and, and to see, most importantly, I suppose, whether there was consistency in the principles on which uh, individuals or the arbitrators made decisions. Sure. So, so we we managed to design a small database that uh, that let people do that. But by now there are so many disputes and so many opinions, and these sure, these sure. are interesting. You might take a look at at these. There's uh, they're still, I'm sure, on the ICANN website. Oh yeah. It's fascinating, uh, the, the body of law that's been built and the fact that it's jurisdiction independent, I think is also really interesting. Well, I want to open it up for other people to ask questions, but I, I have a couple other things I want you to talk about before we do that. First of all, can you talk a little bit about um, the birth of CITDR, the launch of ADR Cyber Week, the evolution to NCTDR? I'm interested also in the roots of the uh, international conference. You know, I think the first one was 2001 in Geneva, right? And uh, I was... Uh, I was wondering how that came about, you know, and then the fellows program that's emerged, you know, can you talk about sort of that part of what you've worked on over the years? Right. Well, um, we have an annual meeting. It's an annual international meeting of um, people interested in ODR. It's been sponsored by, um, by us, meaning group of people interested in ODR since 2001. Uh, the idea was not mine. The idea was, uh, that of a fellow who worked for the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Uh, they were located in Geneva in the UN's um, compound. And uh, he thought ODR would be good for disputes arising out of e-commerce, mostly e-commerce handled by uh, people in the former Soviet republics. So that was his interest. Uh, we have to master the uh, more complicated telephone technology. Yeah, to get second to time in a week this has yeah. happened to me. <laughs> uh -huh. Anyway, um, so there were about some, he, he asked me to help him with that. And uh, we actually had two meetings, uh, 2001, 2002 in, in, uh, in Geneva. Uh, not large groups, but uh, people interested in the, in the field. And uh, it became clear that it would be useful to have a meeting every year or so, which we have since, since then. I think the 2003 or four meeting was in uh, Melbourne. And mm -hmm. maybe then there was a meeting in Cairo. Mohammed Wahab is here, I saw. Yeah, uh, from Cairo, and we've we've held them everywhere. We've held them in Israel. We've held them in recently in New Zealand. We held one. Colin organized in Silicon Valley. We held one in New York and Paris. We've been holding them in places that we we thought people would like to go to, and um, it's it helped in expanding the field. Um, nothing has helped to expand the field more than uh, COVID, which forced right. people to do things at a distance. But but uh, the field was growing even before uh, tragedies of this year. Well, I think uh, you look a little bit like Nostradamus. I mean, with all of these predictions and then COVID happened, people say, oh, wow, how did you see this coming? Like, well, I, I didn't know that a pandemic was going to be what was going to force ODR to become so mainstream, but uh, I guess we have been thinking about this for 20 years, so it's good to have that well of expertise to inform us in this crisis. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, been, it's been gratifying in a way, but 
disturbing also in a way because um, all of this made sense. I mean, telehealth made sense beforehand, I think. Sure. sure. Um, Telelaw made sense beforehand. Um, Richard Suskind has been out there for 25 years, essentially with the same message that you know, the, the, the legal profession is, is doomed. Well, it wasn't. Well, that, is that the summary of Richard's yeah. message? That's terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, but. that was his. That was his message in his first uh, three books. And he, I think he's mellowed a little bit over the years, no, but I, I do no. think it, you know that law and technology side of it has been kind of parallel to ODR. I mean, you're right; it's been growing in the same way. But I, I mean, I, part of me, and again, before I open it up, I think people have questions that they want to ask. But what does it feel like to have you know kind of planted these seeds and been thinking about this before anybody else was thinking about it and writing about it, and now? I mean, to have this announcement from the Royal, the Reserve Bank of India that they're mandating ODR, you know, nationwide for payments. I mean, that's just one of the latest examples. You see ODR cropping up all over the place. The last international ODR conference we had was hosted by the National Center for State Courts. I mean, uh, what does it feel like to have played the role that you've played in creating this movement that seems to be growing that's faster a, and faster? A, a generous question, Colin, Colin but it, it, frankly, it doesn't feel like anything. Really, um, so it doesn't feel like you know. It's it's. There's no no Nobel Prize, no advance in science, no advance in in medicine. Um, no no no. This isn't going to contribute. I maybe it will, but who knows? Contribute to um, you know the development of uh, therapeutics or vaccines or uh, mm -hmm. things that have a major impact on society. But uh, at least not today. Maybe. Maybe well over over more time, but sure. Yeah, sure. This has been you know certainly gratifying, and uh, you know when you proclaim probably three or four times a year that I'm the found father of ADR. Way more than that, you just don't hear. You know, that other reminds time. me of this, and, but but still, uh, it's 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 not earth shaking. Jim says that in the chat. He it's says, gratifying. He's a publicist. So uh, yeah, we need to get you an agent so that you can uh, claim your yeah. your rightful faith. And you're a little bit too lackadaisical about your uh, your foundational role here, but that's okay. We're all on top of it, so we'll take care of it for you. <laughs> um, now I will ask. Obviously, your scholarship, starting with online dispute resolution, and then uh, you did the book with Orna, Digital Justice. You edited with Mohammed and Dan, ODR Theory and Practice, and I know you're working on a new edition of that book. Um, you know, one of the things we just did a joint presentation to at a Harvard conference about is your concept of the fourth party, uh, which has been so foundational and which seems to, if anything, become more and more salient as ODR evolves because technology is, is taking on, you know, more and more capabilities as processors become more powerful, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, how does this uh, edition of ODR theory and practice differ, for instance, from the, the prior one? You know, what, what are trends you see in the scholarship side of all of this? Well, I think uh, the field has broadened. The kinds of disputes that are arising are uh, are different from the kinds of disputes that arose in 2012. Uh, so that's that's when the first. It's hard for me to believe that it's been eight years since that, that came book came out. Mm -hmm. um, but we have new chapters on dispute system design, on accessibility. Um, number of other 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 I think there are 26 chapters altogether mm. our uh, agreement with the publisher last time was that um, they sell the book for six months and then after that or about six or eight months after that we could put it online for free mm -hmm. um, and Jim just posted a link to all of the chapters in the chat so people yeah can go the, the link as I understand, it broke the earlier this week, but we'll get back up. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, sure, Colin, I'll promote Digital Justice, which uh, came out two years ago, and uh, I think has a lot of interesting stuff in it. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and again, talking about the fourth party, I think it's very interesting yeah. that when you first came up with that in 2001, 2002 with Janet, you know, we didn't know about 
artificial intelligence or machine learning or blockchain or smart contracts or crowdsourced, you know, uh, all these concepts were kind of yet to be invented. But the, the concept that you came up with, I think, really resonates. And I think in the ODR field, we, we talk more about fourth party than we talk about, say, AI and machine learning. Um, because I think it really does fit into the overall theory of how, you know, dispute resolution works. So, um, it, I mean, who knows where we're going to be in 10 years when Google invents an antenna, we can just screw into our head and communicate telepathically, but I guess that'll be fourth party too. Well, anything having to do with technology relates to the fourth party, but, you know, in 2001, when Jan and I, uh, were writing this, um, <laughs> You're an important guy, Ethan. That's, uh, you know, the best practice for video mediation is you should turn off all of your devices before you start the session. So, yeah, well, how, how do you turn off a, a, a landline phone? Oh, that's a good question. Unplug it from the wall. That's pretty much the only way you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, why don't we take some questions? Yeah, let's do that. Let's open it up. So um, what we'll do is uh, what I, you can either raise your hand uh, and then I'll call on you or you can post your question in the chat and then we'll circle them. Um, but uh, so uh, please, if anyone has any questions, uh, let's see. Jeremy, you've got a question. Please, what would you like to ask? So hello, everybody. And, and this is obviously for Ethan, but maybe Colin or anybody else in the call. Where it's fascinating to hear the, the history, and thank you for organizing this. Um, really rich and, and very interesting. I think so far we're talking about the history and the evolution of the process and what is happening online from text all the way onwards. Could I ask you, what are your views in terms of going a bit more upstream? In other words, process design, trying to use now all these technologies to try and do triage and then be able to shape um, dispute resolution processes that are more bespoke um, with the nature of the disputants. Uh, Ethan, I don't know if you've, you're working on these projects, but you know, you've know you clearly covered arbitration with UDRP and you've covered mediation, high throughput, low throughput. Oh, um, but what are I you apologize, but I, I didn't hear the beginning of your question. Yeah, I, let me rephrase it, Jeremy, and tell me if I got it wrong. Jeremy's asking about what is being done in terms of moving upstream, like uh, maybe maybe earlier uh, interventions, not only in a dispute, but even to prevent the dispute from arising in the first place. You know, technology gives us access that we'd never had in the face-to-face -face world. Is that something that, um, did I characterize that correctly, Jeremy? It's that, but it's also another element, which is process design. Um, you know, when you look at UDRP, that's very much an arbitration uh, and adjudicative process. When you look at some of the other things have been more remote, mediate, mediated, whether text or in person, integrating all of these to think of how do you design bespoke processes that can have these components of what is facilitative dialogue together with adjudicative issues on specific points. Are you looking at or thinking of triage and bringing these things together into a platform that will provide more of these things? That's a first question. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have another question for later on if nobody else has. So Ethan, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I think the technology is is flexible, and I, I think well two things. One is uh, I strongly believe that the technology can help us prevent disputes, and that that's a design challenge. Uh, recent book, Dispute System Design, by Jan Martinez and two others. Uh, the subtitle starts out prevention three words, prevention, I don't remember the, the other two words, but I think prevention is, is using technology to try to prevent disputes, to design systems that, uh, in which disputes might be dealt with before they become, escalate into bigger disputes. Uh, that, those are opportunities. So uh, in terms of the opportunities we now have compared to the opportunities we had, had back then, well, I don't think there's any comparison. Um, can we design new new systems that you know somehow are, are either combinations of or or distinct from mediation or arbitration or negotiation? Yeah, I think there's uh, room for creativity. And it's, it's Ethan's session, so I will stay brief. But I will say, Jeremy, if I go think back to the early days of ODR, 
all the systems we were launching looked just like face-to-face -face processes. I mean, the first online mediation process I built was just a copy of a face-to-face, -face, and the UDRP looks a lot like an arbitration. The farther we get from that big bang, the more ODR is starting to look unique. And I think the dispute systems design challenges in ODR are now really interesting because we have some powerful tools that don't exist face-to-face. -face. So I couldn't agree with you more. Working upstream, technology gives us access to cases so much earlier, even before the complainant notifies the respondent. And we never have that in the face-to-face -face world. So we have a lot of new questions to answer because the relevance our reach is expanded so significantly earlier into these cases and even later post settlement, we can uh, continue our relationship. So I think it's really forcing a rethinking of what dispute resolution is because it's giving us so many new capabilities. So that I think that's exciting, but it's also a challenge for us. Um, so hope that answers your question. All right, I gotta get to some of these other ones because they're great ones that are, ask, that are being asked. Uh, let me start with uh, Sharon's question. She said, Ethan, the private sector has embraced ODR as kind of, quote, time is money. Yet for those of us in the, in the courts, because Sharon works in the courts in Colorado, how can we best champion digital transformation as opposed to a focus only on efficiency? Well, I think the goal, of course, is to have um, better decisions or better opportunities or fairer outcomes. Um, you know, maybe that means cases aren't going to the courts. Uh, hmm. I mean, ADR, I mean, the, I, 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 what I, I, I'm not sure of the answer to any of these, but uh, ADR was meant to originally be kind of independent of the courts. It ended up not really being independent of the courts. Um, What's happening with ODR, uh, particularly now when everything's been accelerated and being accelerated, um, I like to think that we have new opportunities to handle disputes. Plus, I, I should say, I, I think enormous numbers of disputes are going to come out of the COVID situation. Uh, all kinds of disputes involving healthcare, everything that's been rushed and hurried over the last uh, eight months. A lot of that's going to end up either in courts or in ODR systems or ADR systems. Um, but I, I think that in the near term, that, that that's actually, I think, mostly what I'm interested in. How we can deal with those large numbers of disputes that I think are, are a wave that's coming. Well, and I think in Sharon's question is the notion of is ODR going to become part of the courts or is ODR going to build a new justice system or become the basis of a new justice system that actually competes with the courts and takes cases away? Um, you know, I know there are people that are writing about what they call decentralized justice, which is a notion of a based justice system that's not backed by the power of the state. And so who knows? I'm not sure which model is going to win out. Um, okay, Jeff asked, as new platforms inevitably come forward, Beyond the application of the ICODER standards, how will we as a community avoid infighting as to processes these platforms will use? Will we need mediation for the mediators? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know uh, is that thus far, my interaction with almost everybody in the ODR field has been very cordial. Uh, that's just, personal experience. Um, people in the ADR field, ODR field, did I say ADR? I meant ODR field. Um, and I don't know how to account for that. Uh, I once, uh, in my earlier career, I was part of the law and technology, law professor and technology field. And um, those people got along well for a period of time and then and there were competitions and all kinds of things. So I'm hopeful in the ODR field, we can, as ODR expands, um, we can maintain the manner in which you know, people are asking cordial questions and interacting and forming relationships. And hopefully the field will develop a set of principles and standards that we adhere to. Um, so I'm, so that's one thing I'm optimistic about. 
Well, you set the tone for the field in creating it. And I think that that tone lives on. Uh, I think that that is everyone who's involved with NCTDR, it, even though there may be overlapping, you know, co-opetition kind of environments where one provider is competing with another provider, still it's very open, very collaborative. So I, you know, I think you played a role in setting things off on the right foot. Hopefully um, it'll stay that way. Um, okay, next question. Claire asks, I'm interested in how Ethan initially envisioned ODR as tech tools to support the human mediator, tech to handle the simple disputes that humans can focus on, so that humans can focus on the more, or to prevent disputes from escalating and becoming uh, more complicated. And has your view of that, that initial view changed over time? Well, uh, Janet Rifkin and I wrote this book, uh, Resolving Disputes in Cyberspace in 2001. Uh, idea, the metaphor of the fourth party was there. And uh, that was not going to be a standalone fourth party. It was going to be a fourth party that uh, a technology that somehow helped the mediator or arbitrator, but mostly mediator um, in the tasks that mediators uh, do. So if you look at all the tasks that mediators do, you, know, you can probably make a list of 50 of them. Um, technology can help with those things. I, I think what's different now is, um, is that you know, we can envision technology playing a larger role. Now, this may be desirable or not desirable, um, but algorithms can handle resolving disputes, some kinds of disputes. Again, mm -hmm. I, I think are troublesome aspects of that, but um, but but that's inevitable use of te the technology that we've developed. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, those algorithms also help prevent disputes. But who knows? Well, I recall from one of your books, one of the early books, you said an inevitable result of the expansion of information technology is a loss of privacy. And what's going to happen is over time, people are going to become more comfortable with the fact that they have less privacy. And I think that's almost happening with algorithmic dispute resolution tools as well. This whole, no whole notion that algorithms would sort of facilitate disputes or evaluate um, cases, you know, that seems incredibly creepy and kind of off-putting. But over time, maybe we're getting more used to that concept as technology becomes more flexible and uh, maybe more capable. So maybe over time, we're going to get, we're going to actually prefer that algorithms resolve our disputes as opposed to going to a human judge or arbitrator. I don't know. Well, also, if there are more and more disputes, we don't have the human number of human beings who can handle all those disputes. Uh, That's right. That, yeah. that, you know, part of the consequence of ADR. Um, but if uh, all of our technology, use of technology currently generates lots of disputes, how are they going to be resolved? Um, Absolutely. We're not doing a very good job. I mean, if you look at the social networks, um, I'll plug my book, Digital, or in my book, Digital Justice, again, they're outlined, laying out of all the kinds of new disputes that we are engaged in encountering. And uh, yeah, that's, that's troublesome if we're not at the same time trying to design systems uh, to avoid those disputes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's so many good questions and I know we're running out of time. So I'm gonna surface a few more. Um, Richelli asked, uh, if we think about the Z generation who lives mostly in the digital sphere and engage in social media most of their days, they speak the digital language and ODR systems will be mostly the way they would embrace them when they have disputes. So that look, look like, you know, where do we, where do we, we think that's the, as we, do you have thoughts about that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of that. Sometimes. Well, I think we're talking about like the digital natives, the younger generation, you know, they may have a comfort with technology that, that we'll never have because we're digital immigrants. We were born into a world where the technology didn't exist and it arose. So what is, you know, maybe part of the adoption of ODR will be accelerated by the norms that the younger generation has for the way that they interact. Um, I think this connects in also to, um, I think Chuck asked the question, what role benefits and concerns do you see for AI and ODR systems design development and implementation? So maybe you can address all of that. It's kind of a, a future prediction question. Yeah, well, it's not so far into the future. 
really AI is uh, finding a presence in all kinds of systems and uh, a lot of challenging work to be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we certainly, I mean, this you know, connected with all the issues involving algorithms. Uh, how, how do you understand what's even happening? And how do you understand how, how disputes are arising? And how do you understand what opportunities there are mm -hmm. to resolve or prevent disputes? But, um, you know, there's a ton of work to be done. Oh, yeah. Well, Will asked, how do we assure equal access to justice through ODR when there are significant disparities in access to technology, particularly among poorer communities? Well, I, I agree with that and somewhat don't agree. Um, there's certainly a digital divide of some de to some degree, but I personally don't think it's as large as, as uh, some others may think. Um, and we proposed, um, Jeff Oresti and I proposed uh, to the Massachusetts courts in 2006 that they establish an online small claims court and the response wasn't very positive and among other things they said well not everybody has a computer well uh, everybody has can go to the library if they have to file a complaint uh, it's certainly the opportunities online may be easier to achieve than the opportunities offline Mm -hmm. um, I think all of the court, e-courts and the Utah court and other courts that are uh, surfacing um, will provide data on whether people can, can use these systems or not use them. But I, I think there, there, there's people, certain part of the pub, public population is uh, this is, is has less opportunity, fewer opportunities than others, but I'm not sure that's a reason to discourage use of technology in the courts. Yeah, the big breakthrough from my perspective is mobile technology. It's amazing yeah. how much that's penetrated. I think the Pew Center for Internet and Society tracks internet access amongst the American population, and it's right around 90%. I wonder what it is for telephones, traditional telephones, or even postal addresses, because a lot of people don't have permanent addresses anymore. So there's interesting, in, interesting questions that need to be answered, but it seems to me that's a systems design challenge, and that number is only going to go up in terms of internet access over time. Um, Courtney asks, this is an interesting question, at what point does the increasing comfort with technology and increasing discomfort with the imperfection of people get scary. So what do you think about that? Are we gonna, are we gonna essentially say humans are complicated, we're just gonna let the algorithms make all the calls? No, I, I personally am becoming more and more troubled by the use of technology. So I don't, I don't if the premise is that we're going to buy into the use of technology completely, I mean, you can figure out an answer to that as, as well as I can, but sure. I mean, there, there are reason, there are multiple reasons during during the day to say to yourself, technology is the problem. <laughs> Got to do something about this. Like when you can't turn off the ringer on your landline phone. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I still have a landline phone, so. There you go, there you go. Get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, I still think technology is a tool. So it, it, uh, the, the fourth party is always going to be controlled by the third party. And that's good. We don't want the fourth party to be controlling the third party, we want vice versa. So, but you know, that, that means how do we, we have to figure out, design these systems so the third party and the fourth party can cooperate. Right. And that the, the third party doesn't feel pushed around by the technology or limited by it. And that's going to be a big systems design challenge, it seems to me. Well, OK, we're coming up on it. It's 1058. There's some, there's more great questions in here. Um, but Jamie asked, what's the book again that Ethan mentioned regarding preventing disputes? Yeah, it's called Dispute System Design. Yeah. And uh, while I've been talking to you, it occurred, the first subtitle is Preventing, Resol then Resolving, 
and Jan, I don't remember the third word. Preventing, managing, and resolving conflict by oh. Lisa Bumgren Hensler. Janet, yes, Jan's on the call. Yes, Jan, please. Yeah, I was gonna put the link uh, on the chat, but Wonderful. Jan, can, Jan is here with us. Absolutely. Well, we need to do another session with Jan so we can talk about ODR and dispute okay. systems. I'll be great. Yeah, Thanks. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful book, yeah. And very important for the future of ODR because we have to think about how do we design these systems. And that's a lot of what iCoder is focused on too. So I guess, uh, you know, there's great questions here, Ethan, maybe I'll email them to you and we can uh, uh, get some, some answers to some of the ones we didn't have time to address. But I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time. I'm to call you call, if not uh, for all of the work you did laying the foundations for the field. I personally owe my entire career to you, um, but uh, uh, I'm not sure. And a lot of other people feel the same way, but it's wonderful to get this on the record and, and ask you these questions and record this for posterity. But um, uh, thank you very much for taking the time today and uh, can't wait to see where all of this is heading in the future. So any last thoughts before we wrap no, up? Thank you for showing up. It's, uh, well, I just wanted to add very quickly that I, I participate in one of the, um, bar associations uh, in the uh, ADR section. And, and as you know, Colin, I was uh, the ADR program administrator for the, call, uh, the court in Alameda. Mm -hmm. And it was very surprising to me to see the retired uh, presiding judge wanted uh, to become part of the ADR section and, and seeing his despair as to seeing how the court systems are uh, in a detriment right now, having so much difficult with so much backlog. Mm -hmm. And um, in me working on the ADR side of the court system, it, you know, I, I could see that for none of the judges, it was a, a, a priority to put this program uh, running like it should. Um, I remember I, wa I came to your online mediation program uh, right about, you know, when, when they let me go. And mm -hmm. now they're seeing it. How is it that because they never paid attention to these ADR programs, um, now they have, they're going to have to rely on it. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, trainings all over the trial. Uh, the Lawyers Association is giving trainings in ODR. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're crazy running after the, the ODR now because it's a necessity. And, and they didn't create it in any infrastructure. They never put any money into these programs. I'm not judging for all of the courts. Um, some of the courts uh, judges are more welcoming and more willing to, uh, to provide uh, the, the funding and, and, and platform for these ADR programs to, to survive and thrive. But sure. not a lot of them. And that is very unfortunate. Now we're, now they're running after anything that they can think of in order to uh, even bring other attorneys into the uh, ODR, you know, field because they, they want to make sure that they still um, have some way of control with the, with the law. Absolutely. And, then, and they're realizing that the, the entire uh, law system is, it's coming down the drains if they don't, if they don't adapt and they don't change. So, uh, uh, I mean, it, that's, it makes me think of the Gandhi quote. Uh, I think I think Gandhi said, uh, first they ignore you, uh, then they make fun of you, then yeah. they argue with you, and then they say, oh yeah, we always knew you were right. And oh, I sort of feel like that's happened with ODR. And now I feel like the exactly. courts are saying, wow, how are we going to deal with this? And then they're coming to the ODR field and who they made fun of and ignored for a long time and the ADR field by extension and said, hey, can you tell us what we're supposed to do now? So the people that despair most about the future of the justice system are those people who are in the middle of the justice system now, people in legal service bureaus and judges and lawyers. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time. It's, it's definitely a, a turbulent time, but I think your points are all very, very well taken. But I do want to respect everyone's time here, including Ethan's. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. And Ethan, this isn't the end of the conversation, but we, we do appreciate this presentation. And I will share it more widely with all the iCoder members. So well, thank, thank you, everyone. You. Stay healthy, take care, and we'll see you online again soon.